The right relaunches on immigration. Turkey's tallest dissident. Erdogan is using his power to abuse people. And local news stations outsourcing the news. Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly announced today that all airlines flying to the U.S. will have to enforce stricter security measures. But so far, officials are keeping exact details under wraps. These measures will be both seen and unseen, and they will be phased in over time. The new rules appear to be a way around expanding the laptop ban that currently applies to flights out of 10 airports in the Middle East and Africa. Anti-government protests continue today in Venezuela, amid confusions over an alleged terror incident at the Supreme Court Tuesday evening. The government says police officer and sometime actor Oscar Perez, along with two other people, stole a helicopter and fired shots and threw grenades at the court building. No injuries were reported. Opponents accuse President Nicolas Maduro of orchestrating the attack to justify further crackdowns against his political opponents. Three activists who are investigating labor conditions in Chinese factories that produce shoes for Ivanka Trump's fashion brand and other companies have been released from police detention on bail. The three men were working as undercover investigators for the New York-based organization China Labor Watch, which accused the factory's owner of violations including low pay, forced overtime, and verbal abuse. The factory denies allegations of wrongdoing, and Trump's company said it hadn't used the supplier since March. British Prime Minister Theresa May announced that 120 housing tower blocks have failed safety tests following the deadly fire at Grandfell Tower. The June 14th fire in London killed at least 80 people. Is cladding with a combustible core such as polyethylene legal for use on high-rise buildings? And was the cladding of Grenfell Tower legal? A man rammed his car into a Ten Commandments statue outside the Arkansas State Capitol this morning and broadcast the act on Facebook Live. The statue was installed yesterday and had been standing fewer than 24 hours. The 32-year-old driver, Michael Tate Reed, said he believes that statues like this one breached the separation of church and state. But one thing I do not support is the violation of our constitutional right to have the freedom that's guaranteed does. And this isn't the first time Reed has destroyed a statue. In 2014, he drove into a Ten Commandments statue outside of the Oklahoma Capitol. At the White House today, President Trump held a meeting with a very specific set of Americans, people who say they're the victim of crimes by undocumented immigrants. Nobody died in vain, I can tell you. The photo op was part of a larger push to revive the president's promise to crack down on illegal immigration. On Capitol Hill, the House is working on a new sanctuary city bill that would penalize states and cities that ignore federal immigration laws. And members are also due to vote this week on a measure that would toughen the punishment for repeat border crossers. But the hardliners in Trump's anti-immigration base want even more, and they're losing their patience. As far as immigration goes, Donald Trump is one of the most conservative presidents in recent memory, and his administration has already taken some major steps to rein it in, like changing the priorities for immigration officers. Before Trump, they targeted only those who had committed the most serious crimes. After Trump, there's officially no hierarchy anymore. That means any undocumented immigrant who's committed any infraction is fair game for deportation. And today at the White House, Immigration and Customs Enforcement touted how immigration and border crossings have gone down. And that's a good thing, and we should be celebrating that. You'd think that would be enough, but some of the conservative movement's staunchest opponents of illegal immigration still aren't satisfied. They gathered here in Washington this week to keep up the pressure on an administration they say has let them down on some major priorities. This is a radio event called Hold Their Feet to the Fire, an annual gathering of conservative talk radio hosts organized by the anti-immigration group Federation for American Immigration Reform. Robert Law is FAIR's director of government relations. 
He's angry that under the Trump administration, certain undocumented immigrants are still allowed to apply for DACA, an Obama-era executive order that protects some immigrants from deportation. But what's not acceptable from Ferris' perspective is giving these benefits to new illegal aliens who didn't have them before he was elected. And his failure to do that is a betrayal. It's a straight up betrayal of his campaign promise. One of the things that you mentioned is the use of the bully pulpit. And even on that, you said that he is falling a little bit short. What's going on there? The messaging out of the White House has been a disaster, quite frankly. They were very clear on the campaign trail. And now that they're actually in office, they're all over the map and say one thing one day and another thing the next. And it seems like that lack of clarity from the White House is giving congressional leadership sort of the, the leverage they need to advance their own agenda. What Robert and others who agree with him want to see from Congress are more sweeping immigration bills. So these smaller bills being debated on the Hill don't really cut it. It's a baby step. Uh, the two bills are, are very narrow. I mean, and they're fine, and, and you know, there are aspects of them that we that we support, but the strategy completely misses the mark. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell announced yesterday that he doesn't have the votes to pass his Obamacare replacement bill. Legislation of, of this complexity. Uh, almost always takes longer than anybody else would hope. The majority leader now says he wants a new deal by Friday, but it's his own party that can't agree on a way forward. A big part of the problem is that the bill would remake a program at the center of the American healthcare system. On November 19, 1945, just two months after the end of World War II, President Harry Truman sent a message to Congress proposing that the nation tackle a new challenge. Americans didn't have equal access to health care, he said, and never would, quote, unless government is bold enough to do something about it. The time had come, he said, for universal national health insurance. Truman's plan was denigrated as socialized medicine, and it failed, but not permanently. Well, today, Mr. President and my fellow Americans, we're taking such action 20 years later. In July of 1965, President Lyndon Johnson went to Harry Truman's hometown of Independence, Missouri, to present a major victory, the law creating Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare was true national health insurance for seniors. Medicaid was a bit different. Designed to cover the poor, it would be run by individual states as they saw fit, as long as it covered certain low-income and vulnerable groups and certain kinds of health care. States would kick in a percentage of funding for the program, and the federal government would fund the rest, as much as it took to cover everyone eligible. Medicaid became a core part of the American safety net, and therefore, a favorite target of small government conservatives. Even so, when President Obama made the next radical change to health care in 2009, he broadened Medicaid's role. In an effort to help cover all Americans, the Affordable Care Act gave states the choice to expand Medicaid to adults with incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level and had the federal government foot the bill. 31 states in the District of Columbia opted for the expansion, which was a big reason the Affordable Care Act made major strides in coverage. Medicaid now covers 72.5 million Americans, including more than a third of all children in the U.S. But conservatives never stopped believing that healthcare was better left to the free market. And the election of President Trump, after years of sour public opinion about Obamacare, seemed to be the perfect opportunity to roll back Medicaid. The Senate health care bill goes after the program on two fronts. It would phase out Obamacare's Medicaid expansion by 2024, but it would also fundamentally change the program itself, putting new per capita caps on Medicaid funding. In the long run, that would dramatically cut the amount of money the government spends on the program. It's one of the main reasons the Congressional Budget Office estimated this week the bill could cost 22 million people their coverage. So we and why Republican moderates have been unwilling to back the proposal. Because for all of the decades of criticism about so-called socialized medicine, there's one unchanging fact about Medicaid. It works.
Last summer, a failed military coup in Turkey left at least 249 people dead. In the months since, the country's president, Recep Erdogan, has tried to silence his opposition, largely by putting them in jail. Over the past year, the Turkish government has detained more than 100,000 people. Erdogan's government has accused many of these prisoners of being followers of religious leader Fatela Gulen, the man he blames for organizing the coup. In Turkey, the crackdown has spread rampant fear among Erdogan's critics. But in the United States, it's inspired one follower of Gulen to become a new and unlikely voice of dissent. Are you gonna be okay, sir? Am I? You can be okay. I'll, I'll be okay, sir. Is it weird to play as yourself? I don't pick myself. I you don't pick. You don't put yourself in the game. <laughs> uh, sometimes I do, but you can sub yourself in whenever you want. Okay. I won't judge you. Ennis Kenner is 25 years old and six feet 11 inches tall. Are you kidding me? At least you can hit threes, right? Yeah. He plays in the NBA, where he's earned a reputation for introducing players to halal food, starring in goofy videos with teammates, Rubies! and speaking out against Turkey's president, Erdogan. He's a terrible man, definitely. Oh, thank you. Cantor and I ordered dinner to my apartment. He'd spent the day fasting for Ramadan. Let's see, I got a large shish kebab. Okay. Yeah, I got a chicken mix grill. Okay. And I got a large vegetable platter with hummus, baba okay. ganoush. Where's yours? Uh, kefir. <laughs> Where's <laughs> mine? <laughs> Cantor is a longtime follower of Gulen, a 76-year-old preacher and outspoken critic of Turkey's president. For the past few decades, Gulen has lived in exile in rural Pennsylvania. But that hasn't stopped Erdogan from labeling him and his followers terrorists. Erdogan is using his power to abuse people. And that's what's really making me, you know, driving me crazy. He doesn't do nothing wrong. He's always right. He's always perfect. If you don't believe in that, then he wants you to be out of the country or he will put you in a jail if you keep uh, talking about it. Cantor's one of Turkey's most famous athletes. So his political views, which he often shares on social media, have enormous reach. And his opinions haven't gone unnoticed by Erdogan's regime. Keep up with us. Last month, the Turkish government abruptly canceled Cantor's passport, leading to a confusing few hours in Bucharest, Romania, where he was stranded at the airport. I will uh, keep you posted, guys, but just pray for us. Eventually, he was allowed to fly to New York. Where are you heading to? Heading home. We are allowed to go back to America now. But a few days later, Turkish media reported that Turkey had issued a warrant for Cantor's arrest, accusing him of being a member of a terror group. What do you think would have happened if you were sent back? I'll be in a jail, and probably the second day, you'll be here from the news, and, oh, he just got poisoned, and he just died. He got food poison. Or, or he was depression, he hanged himself. I don't know. I'm just giving examples. Because when I talk, it goes everywhere. They hate it. Two weeks after Turkey canceled Cantor's travel documents, it jailed his father for almost a week. Even though his parents have publicly disowned him, Cantor hasn't spoken to them in more than a year. They put a letter out there and say, we disowned Enes because he's speaking out against Erdogan. If they didn't send that letter out, then they will be in a jail last year. Right. When I saw that your parents had put that statement out, my first thought was, but Enes grew up going to a school in a school? Yes. Yeah. So I didn't, in second grade, I didn't understand what kind of a school it was. Do you think that your father was arrested because you were speaking out? Of course. It was like a kind of like a warning for, uh, for me. Oh, if you don't stop talking, we'll put your dad in jail and your mom will be next. They think I'm going to stop talking. But no, when they do it, I want to talk more to tell all these people, like, this is what's really going on. Do you worry that next time it won't just be jail? I mean, I mean, the, the worst thing it could happen is just, you know, the jail or just, you know, they're, they're going to torture him in jail or they're going to, you know, just get raped. And that's the most terrible thing that will happen. I understand my family, of course, important. I love my family. I love my country. But I have to do this uh, for, you know, all the citizen people. Cantor signed a $70 million four-year contract with the Oklahoma City Thunder in 2015. His public battle with the Turkish government could make it harder for him to honor some of his obligations. So what happens next? With you, you don't have a Turkish passport. You have a, a green card here, yes. right? 
Well, I'm, is the NBA helping you or the Oklahoma they, State Thunder I'm helping I'm going to talk to them because, I mean, we're going to play against Toronto Raptors in Canada. So I'm, I need to be able to leave the country. Have you thought about the fact that you might never be able to go back to Turkey? That's the risk I'm taking. That's the risk I'm taking. And of course, uh, I said before, I love my country. I love my flag. I miss my, you know, Turkish food. But this is way bigger than basketball. This is way bigger than NBA. This is way bigger than everything I'm doing. Americans' trust in the news media is at an all-time low. But given the choices they're offered, local news is often the source people trust the most. Now there's an app called Fresco that could complicate that. Local news stations around the country are using it to outsource the gathering of news footage to anyone with a smartphone. Ellie Reeve went to Alaska to see how it works. Can you hear me? Seven, six, five. The Anchorage Police Department are looking for a witness to a shooting. This footage was captured by one of our Fresco team members who was on the scene today. This footage would have normally come from a professional journalist. Instead, it was shot by a retiree with her phone. Fresco is like Uber for journalism. A newsroom puts out a request for coverage of a story, and people in the area accept and take a video of it. They get their credit on, on, on the television screen or in the newspaper. It was created by John Meyer, who developed one of the first flashlight apps for the iPhone. The community is getting Reporters write the voiceover, and the anchor reads it as viewers see B-roll captured by Fresco users. A home in Penland Park received a fresh coat this weekend. Fresco says it's being used by 13 news stations across the country and expanding to 38 local newspapers. It's especially appealing to KTBY, which covers the entire state of Alaska. Where the weather is happening. Weather, I'll tell you what, Ellie. Uh-huh. Weather is what people watch the news for. Right. Yes. Especially in Alaska. KTBY has been hailed as the first station fully powered by Fresco. So what does it mean that your station is fully powered by Fresco? That was something that Fresco came up with uh -huh. because we're not fully powered by Fresco. My opinion, I think, I really believe that eventually that's where all news is going. It kind of makes me think of the Steve Martin joke, though. It's like, um, sure, 72 virgin sounds nice, but after five or six, you're going to want a pro. <laughs> like, don't people want, you know, professionals to give them the news, the context? Journalists still write the story, see? As far as the visual aspect, the viewing public doesn't need a pro. They don't care about a pro. What is a pro? If you ask the general public, they don't know. They just see something that's pleasing to them. Right now, the Fresco events that have been popping up are just like National Cat Day and stuff like that. They want footage of moose around town. Holly Andrews is an esthetician in Wasilla. She says she's made more than $1,500 doing Fresco on the side. Fresco pays users $40 per story. This stands in contrast to the hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars a freelance video journalist would cost. I went to some bike race event. It was just me and the news crews and then all the people biking. And that was kind of awkward. I didn't feel so comfortable with that. I'm not a professional. I felt like if somebody came and tried to do lashes that had never been to school or never been trained, I would be like, what are you doing? Why are you here? doing my job. <laughs> Some of the stuff's hard to just sit for a minute and kind of record. Do you ever feel nervous trying to interview a politician? Yeah, there was one time where they were like, we want you to go into his office and ask all these like serious questions about the state. And I wasn't sure I wanted to go into an office and grill a politician. That seemed a little bit on the more serious side. Scott Sinners came to the station seven years ago and says he brought it into the digital age. He led the partnership with Fresco. So, uh, 
Using Fresco, we were able to cut cost, and so what was once a $3,000 average cost now comes down to less than $200. Have you laid people off because you're able to use Fresco? Absolutely not. Oh. Absolutely not. Moving forward, there's no requirement for the same amount of people that, that we had previously. You just won't rehire some people who correct, left. Correct, correct, correct. That's a fair statement. And does Fresco play into that? Absolutely. This is from the Oso landslide. 42 or 43 people were killed. There's no room for screwing that up. I mean, it's too sensitive of a story. It's just too heavy. Caroline Hall worked for years as a photojournalist in TV news, including at two stations in Anchorage. A lot of the people we talked to have said, well, these people are just getting us B-roll, we do voiceover over it, we're doing the real reporting, they're just getting us something to put on the screen. How can they do the real reporting if they're not on scene? They don't know how chaotic or not chaotic a scene is. I mean, there's so much flavor that is missed when someone is, re is reporting from the studio. Fresco CEO John Meyer rejected the idea that the app would hurt the quality of journalism. He told Vice News that Fresco videos are vetted and that reporting is done in the newsroom. Close to half of U.S. adults turn to local TV as their primary news source, even for national news like presidential elections. And America has determined its 45th president, of, 45th president of the United States of America in Donald Trump. And while print revenue is declining, TV revenue is holding steady. In 2014, local newspaper staffs declined by 10 percent, while local TV staffs grew by 1 percent. Do you lose anything from not sending out a professional photojournalist? Do I lose anything from not spending out, sending out a professional journalist? Um, I absolutely feel strongly that we have um, gained a whole nother resource. So, you know, at this time, no, I don't. It's sad to think that in the future we could have an even less informed society. The future of journalism is just really, it's too important to screw around with, I think. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, June 28th.